Good day, dear grade surgeon. Today we gonna talk about physiology crash course and revise together some targeted chapters within physiology. Physiology is a very important chapter, yet it's very easy to crack because you have every system organized and have a specific number of questions that will come from the pH value and the ABG as well as the Glasgow scale as well as the hybridization and the anticoagulation all of those questions are a must in the exam even the ECG will be a repetitive question within your exam so don't panic and don't create your own monster you can crack physiology and believe me it will be like a piece of cake if you believe deep inside you that you know all what is needed for the exam then you will crack it Look with your eyes in front of this physiology beast and you will beat it down. So let's crack it together. You are a surgeon and your mind will always crave for information. The information for the exam scope is very little and if we tend to use them only without adding some puzzle pieces, your mind will be feeling that there is something is missing. We won't puzzle you with many information, but we will add just the right piece required in your mind to fill in this blank space that mind seeking and carving for, to make the whole story seems complete in your mind. The science is endless, that's why we will add just the point required for your mind to understand the whole information gap without any gap. That's what we all about when we add some extra information beyond your exam scope and if it came in your exam you already know it and can think about it. God be with you. Today we gonna talk about an interesting chapter, an interesting topic in your real life and commonly asked in the exam. So all about the hemostasis and coagulation from the applied point of view. We are here to give you a new information to be added in your real life and how to apply it. Before we talk about the hemostasis and coagulation applied information, let's revise some basic definitions and basic knowledge. The hemostasis is not the same as the homeostasis. Homeostasis is the stability of the organs and the stability of the environmental factors of each tissue. While the hemostasis is simply the stasis of a blood environment what keeps the blood doesn't clot what keeps the blood bleeding clot it's a sequence of tightly regulated process that maintain the blood in a fluid clot free state in a normal vessel while introducing the rapid formation of a localized hemostatic blood at the site of vascular injury so it's what is keeping your blood from clotting in normal stasis and what keeps your blood from a clot when there is an injury. This happens by vasoconstriction, formation of plate plug, coagulation cascade, and the fibrinolysis. So, the normal question when we tell you about hemostasis, why the blood doesn't clot normally in the circulation? There are many factors for this. The endothelial factor, the velocity of the circulation and the presence of the natural anticoagulant in the blood as well as simultaneous activation of the fibrinolytic system along with the clotting mechanism. So what are the endothelial factors? The endothelial factors work to smoothen the endothelial lining that prevent the platelet adhesion and they are negatively charged particles present over the endothelial lining that repel the clotting factor and the velocity within the circulation if decreased lead to clotting so the beating heart rhythm helps in preventing this clotting in normal circulation as well as presence of natural anticoagulant in blood do you know in your blood there is a heparin naturally formed and a protein C as well as thrombomodulin those natural anticoagulants are already within your blood and of course, the simultaneous activation of the fibrinolytic system along with the clotting mechanism will help to prevent clotting in normal circulation. Let's be back and start again. What is the cascade? 
of hemostasis started with vasoconstriction, formation of platelet plug, then coagulation cascade, and the fibrinolysis. I know all of you are eager to talk about the coagulation cascade and all the applied system. So this is important to know why did the blood didn't clot in normal circulation because this affect the Verkaus triad which will identify to you the risk factor for clot formation and DVT formation. If you have a change in the velocity of blood, this will cause a DVT. If there is a stasis of the blood, this will cause a DVT. This is the Verkaus triad. Keep it in mind and we will talk about it in details and its applied physiology information. The vascular spasm result from the local myogenic contraction of the blood vessel which initiated by the direct damage to the vascular wall and the release of the local autocoid factor from the traumatized tissue and the blood platelets. As well as there is a nervous reflex that initiated by the pain nerve impulse or other sensory impulse that originate from the traumatized vessel or the nearby tissue. And here, the release of the vasoconstrictor substance like thromboxan A2 by the platelets, which for the smaller vessels are responsible for the vasoconstriction. Then comes the rule for the platelet plug formation. When the platelets come in contact with any damaged vascular surface, especially with collagen fiber in the vascular wound, the platelets themselves immediately change their own characteristic drastically. They begin to swell, assume irregular forms, contractile protein contract forcefully and cause the release of granules and continue multiple active forces. They become sticky so they adhere to the collagen and adhere to each other. And the tissue protein called von Welbrand factor. So again, they become sticky so that they adhere to the collagen in the tissue and to the protein called von Welbrand factor. So the platelet plug is important and von Welbrand factor is important for the platelet plug formation. Now, what is the mechanism of the platelet plug formation? The platelet secrete large quantities of ADB and their enzyme from the thromboxane E2 and the ADB and the thromboxane in turn. Uh, act on the nearby platelets to activate them as well and the thickness and the additional platelets cause them to adhere to original activated platelets. Thus, the damaged vascular wall activates successfully increase the number of platelets that themselves attract more and more additional platelets and forming the platelet plug. So, from all of this, the platelet plug formed by the injury to the blood vessel attracts the platelets, the platelets secretes thromboxane E2 and ADB and the thromboxane ADB attracts more platelets and it's a vicious circle to form a platelet plug and this is a temporary one. The coagulation, the beloved topic, is a formation of a blood clot. The stage of clotting we have three phases, main three phases. One, the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways that produce the prothrombinase and the prothrombin activators. And the phase two, where the thrombin, prothrombinase converted to prothrombin to thrombin. And the phase three, when we have the thrombin converted the soluble fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin, which in the thread of the clot. We have many clotting factors in blood. They are very famous to be numbered from factor 1 to factor 13. From the factor 1, which is the fibrinogen and the prothrombin factor 2 and the tissue factor, uh, factor 3 uh, and uh, calcium and factor 4. Do you know that the factor 4 is calcium? Yes. And the serum prothrombin conversion, which is factor 7. So keep this all in mind. And very famous recall question about factor 2, he is asking you by its name, prothrombin, and factor 1, which is the fibrinogen. Not many people know the names of the factor, but we have 13 factor almost, with the prokinin and calcium, and you know now that the calcium is factor 4, keep this in mind. What is the intrinsic pathway and what is the extrinsic pathway? 
The intrinsic pathway where there is a blood trauma causes activation of factor 12 and release of platelet phospholipid containing blood factor 3. Then the activated factor 12 enzymatically activate factor 11 which need kinanogen and pericular creatine, and factor 11 enzymatically activates factor 9 with factor 8 and the platelet phospholipid and factor 3 activates factor 10 to 10a. Here the common pass wave starting from factor 10 to 10a and factor 10a and factor 5 with the platelet or the tissue phospholipid form the complex called the prothrombin activator and the prothrombin activator in turn in sheet with the second cleavage of prothrombin to form the thrombin and we are talking here about the phase 2 and phase 3 where the thrombin convert into soluble fibrin into soluble fibrin which is the thread of the clot this is the intrinsic pathway while the extrinsic pathway starts with its king the factor tissue thromboplastin factor 7 release of the tissue factor traumatized tissue release of a complex several factor called tissue factor factor 7 or tissue thromboplastin which in turn activate factor 10 and tissue factor further complex with the factor 7 and in presence of the calcium ion acts enzymatically on factor 10 directly to form activated factor 10 and voila the same phase where factor 10 forms the prothrombin activator and factor 10 a combined with the tissue and plated phospholipid as well as a factor 5 to form complex called prothrombin activator so if i want you to understand something that the intrinsic factor starts with factor 12 and the extrinsic pathway starts with the tissue factor and factor 7. factor 7 is exclusively for the extrinsic pathway and the common pathway starts from factor 10 to 10a we all know this famous coagulation cascade in the intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway the common pathway is starting from factor 10 which is transformed to factor 10a activation and bruce rhombin activator which then goes to form the fibrin tied blood clot now let's have some clamps over the anticoagulant that might be needed. The very first question that must come in your mind we are, when we are talking about the anticoagulant, why we would use anticoagulant and what is the anticoagulant? The anticoagulant from its name, it's a drug that helps to prevent air clotting of the blood. Coagulation will occur instantaneously once a blood vessel has been severed as we all agree mm. and the blood begins to solidify to prevent the excessive blood loss and to prevent invasive substance from entering the bloodstream. And the classification of the anticoagulants is what is used in vivo and what is used in vitro. In vitro which means in the lab while in vivo which can be used in the patient. In the patient, we have the parenteral and the oral route. While in vitro, we can use either the heparin or calcium complexing agent. We all now familiar with the coagulation cascade because this is the key to understand the anticoagulant and how they work. We had the in vivo use anticoagulant, what we use with the patient. We have the parental anticoagulant, which we have the indirect thrombin inhibitor and the direct thrombin inhibitors. So, the indirect thrombin inhibitors are the heparin, the molecular weight heparin, from the purinex, and the danaproid. Why the direct thrombin inhibitor are like the liberdine, bivalurdine, and argaptopan. You have to be familiar with those, especially after the corona. And the oral anticoagulant, we have the coumarine derivatives and the endodione derivatives and the direct factor 10 inhibitors are like the rivaroxaban. We all know that the direct uh, factor 10A inhibitors are targeting the common pathway of the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway as well as the oral direct thrombin inhibitor which also targeting a common pathway, the digaptopran.
So what is the coumarin derivatives? It's like the warfarin. It's like the very famous warfarin and the dicumarol as well as the acinomarol and isine uh, mesitate. The most important in the coumarin derivative is the warfarin. And the most important direct factor 10 inhibitor is the rivaroxaban. And the oral direct thrombin inhibitor, the digiptran. I know there are many names, but we are not in a pharmacology class. We are in a surgical physiology class regarding the anticoagulant. If I want you to understand anything from those, remember that the parental root, we have the heparin, which is the low molecular weight heparin and the unfractionated heparin, as, as, as well as the fondaburinix. And I want you to know that the direct thrombin inhibitor compromises the libertin, bivalutin, and argapvan. And remember that the coumarin derivative is an oral anticoagulant like the warfarin and the direct factor 10A inhibitor like the rivaroxaban is as well an oral anticoagulant. What is used uh, in vitro is important like in uh, in preservation of some blood sampling or else like the heparin or calcium complexing agent like the sodium citrate, sodium oxalate or sodium editate. That's why uh, we can give RBC without coagulation. It's important. How, how can you preserve a blood or can you preserve a blood sample with sodium citrate, sodium oxalate or sodium uh, editate, the editor. Uh, so you have to be familiar with all of those. We will talk about the heparin and the warfarin and they apply uh, pharmacological importance notes but i want to tell you something about the rivaroxaban and the fondapurinex the fondapurinex is a pentasaccharide the specific sequence and binds to um thromboxane 8 uh, the factor 3 with high affinity to selectively inactivate factor 10a without binding to thrombin so it's all about factor 10a without binding to thrombin which is factor 2a so it's all about direct factor 10a without thrombin activation the bioavailability of the fondapurinex if injected will be subcutaneously is 10 is 100 percent and excretion unchanged by the kidney while the direct thrombin inhibitors like liberdine and bivalurdine and argaptoban unlike the heparin this recently developed anticoagulant bind directly to the thrombin and inactivate it without the need to combine with the E23. The oral anticoagulant, we will talk about them, like the coumarin, very famous warfarin drug, which is active by uh, inhibiting the vitamin K. We want to talk about the direct factor 10 inhibitor, right? The rivaroxaban which act rapidly without lag time and they have a short lasting action. This is very important notice you have to know about it. So let's continue and know the applied knowledge about the usage of the heparin and warfarin in the real patient. Regarding the anticoagulation, one of the very famous anticoagulant drugs is the heparin. Heparin causes the formation of complex between the antithrombin and activated thrombin factor from 7, 9, 10, 11, and 12. The advantage of the low molecular weight heparin is better bioavailability and lower risk of bleeding as well as longer half-life. There is little effect over the BDT at prophylactic dosage and there is a less risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and there is a very famous question regarding the heparin induced thrombocytopenia that's more common with the heparin but it's with less risk than the low molecular weight heparin. The complication of course of heparin will be bleeding osteoporosis heparin induced thrombocytopenia which can occur from 5 to 14 days after the first exposure of the heparin and anaphylaxis as any drug can cause anaphylaxis. And by the way, in surgical patients that may need a rapid return to theater, administration of the unfractionated heparin is the preferred as the low molecular weight heparin have longer duration of action and are harder to reverse. So again, heparin works on 7, 9, 10, 11, and 12. 
and if you gonna want to reverse it soon go for the unfractionated heparin if you want to immediately reverse heparin what would you do of course you can use the protamine sulfate a very famous scenario about the immediate reversal this will require protamine sulfate and this is in case of anaphylaxis from the heparin by the way so take care protamine sulfate will reverse heparin but is associated with risk of anaphylaxis and thus not used generally unless there is immediate reversal of anticoagulation needed like a coming of a bypass so let's apply our knowledge about the heparin and its indication contraindication regarding a practical scenario in the exam he will tell you a long scenario about a lady 48 year old lady i know all ladies are static at the age of 25 but in the exam he will tell you another fake age about 48 year old she had a metallic valve and requires to do a para umbilical hernia she was re receiving intravenous unfractionated heparin to perform the surgery safely and normal coagulation state which is the strategy to be followed? Of course, unfractionated heparin to be stopped six hours preoperatively will be sufficient. We don't use the protamine sulfate unless there is immediate reversal of the anticoagulation is needed. As we said, like coming off a bypass. So a patient with metallic heart valve will generally stop unfractionated heparin within six hours preoperatively because the unfractionated heparin is generally cleared from the circulation within two hours again the unfractionated heparin cleared from the circulation within two hours so this will allow plenty of time and this method of choice in the elective setting so let's have another applied scenario regarding the heparin he will tell you about 57 year old man coming off a cardiac bypass circuit again cardiac bypass circuit following a successful coronary artery bypass thanks for the surgeon which drug should be administered to normalize the patient clotting prior to decannulation and chest closure of course here we need an immediate immediate cutting of the heparin effect so a protamine sulfate will be used because since the cardiac bypass circuit are thrombogenic large doses of intravenous heparin are administered during the operation and this is reversed with the protamine sulfate i know fresh frozen plasma might be affected but would carry a significant risk of a fluid overload and he is already having a cardiac bypass so what overload is needed with a fresh frozen plasma isn't it more logic to convert and reverse the heparin so you take the advantage of the heparin during your surgery but after the surgery during your closure do an immediate reversal for this heparin using the protamine sulfate you have to understand a concept regarding the heparin we have the low molecular weight heparin that doesn't require any monitoring while the unfractionated heparin does require monitoring this is done by measuring the ptt he will ask you about this directly in the exam regarding he will tell you an, another scenario about a 43 year old lady and we agree that the lady her real age is 25 it's a constant okay with a metallic valve again and has undergone elective bar umbilical hernia she is the same patient we talked about before so it's 25 confirmed in view of her metallic valve she is given unfractionated heparin preoperatively how should the therapeutic efficiency be monitored for this patient of course the ptt will be sufficient this is the unfractionated heparin required monitoring by the ptt so now we all agree and know that the heparin the friend of the vascular and cardiothoracic surgeons so what dosage will be used for a femoropopletia bypass graft what heparin regimen should be done prior to cross clamping of the femoral artery to do his bypass craft of course the dose of 3000 unit of unfractionated heparin and again the unfractionated that can be monitored and the unfractionated to be reversed three minutes prior to the closure of the clamp 
As a rule, most vascular surgeons will administer about 3,000 units of the systemic heparin three to five minutes prior to cross clamping to help prevent further intraarterial thrombosis. And the dosage of 30,000 units is given prior to going to a cardiopulmonary bypass. So the 30,000 is for cardiopulmonary bypass, while the 3,000 will be given for the femoral popliteal bypass prior to cross clamping. Heparin, if given and induction, will cause bleeding during the routine dissection, and there is no surgeon like any bleeding. The dream of any surgery and the dream of any surgeon to have a clean bloodless surgeon. The clean bloodless field is the dream of us all. If we talked about the heparin, let's now talk about the warfarin. The warfarin is a friend of anticoagulants, but it's the oral form of anticoagulation, which inhibits the reduction of vitamin K to its active hydroquinone which in turn acts on the cofactor in the formation of the clotting factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. You can remember it by 1972 and protein C. So again, warfarin work on 1972 and protein C. The factor that might potentiate the warfarin is the liver disease, P450 enzyme, like the amiodarone, ciprofloxacin. We talked about it before. The the drugs that inhibit and the drugs that enhance the warfarin it's very important by the way so from the very famous drugs that work on it the amiodarone ciprofloxacin even the cranberry juice can enhance and potentiate the warfarin and increase the warfarin action that can cause skin necrosis remember these scenarios yes even the non -stroider. The drugs which display the warfarin from the plasma album like the non or inhibit the platelet functions and like the non -steroidal. The side effect of the potentiation of the warfarin even by increasing the dosage or taking a drug that might potentiate it will cause a very serious side effect like hemorrhage even triatogenic for pregnant female or even the most worst of them is the skin necrosis. When warfarin is best started by the synthesis of protein C is reduced. This results in a temporary procoagulative state after initially starting warfarin, normally avoided by concurrent heparin administration. So, thrombosis might occur in venules leading to skin recrosis. Again, warfarin work on 1972, and the 19 is 10 and 9 not 1 and 9, it's 19, 10 on 9, 72. And again, warfarin interfere with the fibrin formation by affecting the carboxylation of the glutamic acid. Don't confuse you uh, yourself with all those data, just know the factors that potentiate and decrease the effect of the warfarin, know the side effect and from them the skin necrosis, Know the action over 1972. And take care that um, the longest half life approximately about 60 hours. Therefore, it can take up to three days for warfarin to be fully effective. Warfarin has a small volume of distribution as it's a protein bound. Take care. If we talked about the heparin and the warfarin, let's take a glimpse over the death is coming. The DIC. He will tell you in the exam about a very famous scenario about a female 35 year old woman who is uh, 36 week of pregnant gestation rushed to the theater for placenta uprupture following a C-section. She is bleeding heavily around the uterus with oozing from the suture side. The anesthetist notes that the bleeding from here cannula side and the blood show a prolongation of all clotting times. Decrease in platelet count and increase the fibrin degradation product. Is it antiphospholipid syndrome? Is it a DIC or factor leading disease? Is it a hemophilia? Is it a hemophilia B? She is bleeding for every orifice she has her cannula her 
suturing site of the C-section, enhancing a prolongation of clotting time, and decreased platelet count. She is consuming every platelet she has and increased fibrin degradation product. Of course, this is the term that is coming. This is a disseminated intravascular coagulation. This is DIC. DIC is characterized by pathological activation of the coagulation pathway leading to clot formation. This clotting consumes a coagulation factor and the platelet resulting in subsequent bleeding from every orifice the patient have. Common cause of the DIC will include the sepsis, malignancy, especially adenocarcinoma, trauma, and unfortunately, obstetric emergency. And the laboratory features you all know from the scenario already will be include prolongation of all the clotting time and the progressive folding of the platelets count. So when you look at the CBC, don't look over the white blood cells and the RBC. Look at the platelets, please. So, there would be a progressive falling within the platelet count and the fibrin, fibrinogen concentration and increase in the fibrin degradation product. So, the fibrinogen concentration will decrease while increase in the fibrin degradation product. This indicates activation of the fibrinolytic system and in context of the other laboratory abnormalities support a diagnosis of DIC. The treatment will involve intensive blood product support with correction of the underlying cause. So why this case isn't antiphospholipid syndrome? For example, of course she is bleeding from every orifice, so this is DIC confirmed. She had already prolongation of all clotting time, but in antiphospholipid syndrome, you will find that this is an autoimmune condition that predisposes a thrombosis and wouldn't present at this point with increased bleeding when she already at 36 week of gestation she is already having her term baby the antiphospholipid syndrome will cause the abortion earlier than this someone asked me why it's not a hemophilia a or hemophilia b take care hemophilia a and hemophilia b they are inherited bleeding disorder and they will not suddenly appear at this stage this scenario is classic for DIC. How about factor leading disease 5? This will cause a thrombophilia and wouldn't present with excessive bleeding. Take care. This great surgeon, take care. The pro-thrombin time is not the same as the thrombin time. Pro-thrombin, the PT, is not the same as the thrombin time, TT. Don't confuse yourself. We have a partial thromboplastin time, which will increase with the factor A deficiency, while the thrombin time is increased with the hypofibrogenemia. And take care. He will trick you in an exam and tell you a long scenario about a female patient who has been electively admitted for subtotal thyroidectomy and gave history of bleeding disorder and will ask you that the preoperative evaluation showed a prolonged thrombin clotting time he will show you a thrombin clotting time increase tct it's not the same as the thromboplastin time this is a very tricky recall question by the way so the thrombin clotting time is not the same as the partial thromboplastin time and not the same as the thrombin time lots of thrombin here but take care, this is a case of classic hypofibrogenemia. The hypofibrogenemia, you will find that the thrombin clotting time, the TCT, which is also known as the thrombin time, TT, is a coagulation assay that usually performed to assess the fibrin formation. And the prolonged thrombin time or the thrombin clotting time is due to either fibrin abnormalities, impairment of formation, or due to inhibition of the thrombin, like heparin. While in warfarin, which is obviously not a bleeding disorder because the scenario is telling you that the patient giving a history of bleeding disorder, not a drug intake. Drug intake is not the same as disorder. The disease is not as a drug. So warfarin is not a bleeding disorder. So it's not warfarin. And by the way, the warfarin will increase the prothrombin time, not the thrombin time. Prothrombin time increases with the warfarin, not the thrombin time itself. 
and of course it's not factor factor A deficiency because in factor A deficiency hemophilia A would increase the activated partial thromboplastin time the PTT not the thrombin time let's make this voice note more simple regarding the coagulation factor and the disorders regarding the hypofibrogenemia the hypofibrogenemia we are talking about the thrombin clotting time tct while factor 8 deficiency factor 12 deficiency von Welbrand deficiency we are talking about prolongation of the ptt the partial thromboplastin time regarding the warfarin therapy the warfarin therapy will increase the PT, not the PTT, not the TTT, not the TCT. So the prothrombin time increases with the warfarin, while the activated partial thromboplastin time increases with the factor A deficiency, factor 12 deficiency, von Walbrand deficiency. While the hypofibrogenemia is all about the thromboplastin clotting time the TCT which might be called as well the thrombin time TT let's have another scenario hard one regarding a 27 year old man has a deficiency of coagulation factor he is telling you the truth deficiency of coagulation factor that forms a complex with the tissue factor to activate factor 9 and 10 which of the following coagulation factor is most likely to be deficient in this patient this is a very simple question we are talking about the tissue factor of course it's factor 7 without stating any choices so learn to know the answer before reading even the choices is provided in the question and trust in yourself so the tissue factor which is already deficient what is this of course it's not a christmas factor it's all about factor 7 factor 7 formerly known as the broconvertin is one of the central protein in the coagulation cascade it's a serine protease enzyme the main role of factor 7 is to initiate the process of coagulation factor with the tissue factor on the vessel injury for example tissue factor is exposed to the blood and circulating factor 7 and once bound to tissue factor factor 7 is activated to factor 7a by different protease enzyme and among which are the thrombin factor 2a activated and factor 10 becomes factor 10a and the factor 7a tissue factor complex itself so it's all about factor 7 simple answer the question stated the answer so all about the tissue factor deficiency factor 7 in another word we are talking about the extrinsic pathway not the intrinsic pathway factor 7 the king of the extrinsic pathway we talked about the warfarin is causing skin necrosis but what is the mode of action that causes the skin necrosis deficiency in which protein that is responsible for the skin necrosis with the warfarin the warfarin necrosis by potentiation its action or warfarin toxicity is very serious that can cause skin necrosis it is acquired protein deficiency due to the treatment with the vitamin k inhibitor anticoagulant the warfarin so it's feared it's rare but can happen there is no rare rare complication of warfarin treatment can cause skin necrosis and this rare reaction mainly in women usually occur between the second and the fifth day of therapy with warfarin the lesions are sharply demarcated erythematous and indurated and barbaric and can either resolve or progress to form a large irregular hemorrhagic poly with eventual necrosis and the slow healing escar formation this is the warfarin so a one having ischemia in his leg fearing for falling of his leg or some skinny changes you are forcing the patient with the warfarin toxicity to go through skin necrosis take care to make it simple again 
Warfarin will cause skin necrosis by acquired protein C deficiency. It's all about the protein C. Someone asked me about the DIC treatment. Okay, how can you manage the DIC disseminated intravascular coagulation where the this is coming? Of course, it's the fresh frozen plasma and platelet transfusion. Treatment may require intensive blood product support while the underlying cause is already being corrected. This includes the administration of fresh frozen plasma or even a cryoprecipitate and the platelet to replace the deficiency. And take care. Antibiotic may treat an, if an ineffective process contribution, but will not treat the DIC in the short term. It might be needed later on. And the anticoagulation will make the situation worse. Take care. In the IC, there is already an insufficiency of clotting. So any anticoagulation is not used in the DIC. It, it will make the situation worse. So the mainstay will be fresh frozen plasma and platelet transfusion. One sent me regarding the intravenous saline infusion in the DIC. It will not read the process of the IC at all. Has nothing to do with it. It will create an overload or hemodilution if he still has blood and didn't bleed them all. And the thrombin infusion might improve the coagulation to somewhat, but alone is not sufficient. So if you found the DIC, how to treat it, there would be a fresh frozen plasma as well as plated transfusion with a cryoprecipitate. We need the clotting factors because it the oil has been consumed. So thrombin infusion alone is not sufficient. Give fresh frozen plasma, plated transfusion, and to try to save the patient from the death coming with the disseminated intravascular coagulation DIC. If we worked on the DIC and save the patient, how about a patient with warfarin toxicity? How to save this patient from the toxicity of the warfarin? Simply give him vitamin K, which can be used for the reversal of the warfarin in the less urgent situation. But take care, a patient who is 55 years old, admitted with extra dural hemorrhage, and there are known to be on anticoagulant, and the neurosurgeon recommend that the reversion as soon as possible to prevent extravasation of more extradural hemorrhage. What can you use? Of course, prothrombin complex concentrate, the PCC, reverse the warfarin of this patient. Take care. It's to drive it from the human plasma and contain the clotting factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. 2, 7, 9, and 10. The prothrombin complex concentrate, the PCC, provides immediate reversal of the warfarin, but the effect will begin to wear off after 6 to 12 hours. This is the fastest can be, be done with the warfarin. While the vitamin K, yes, can be used because the warfarin mainly act on the vitamin K, but in the less urgent situation, give it vitamin K. In fact, you can give both the vitamin K along with the prothrombin complex contract. Take care. So now you can save a warfarin toxicity patient and now you can save a DIC patient. Go save your patients, dearest great surgeon. How about the unfractionated heparin? How can you reverse it? Of course, protamine sulfate. How about the aspirin? How can you reverse it? Take care. If it's emergency surgery is needed for a patient with aspirin, you can use a plated transfusion, which can reverse to some extent the action of the aspirin, because you all know that the aspirin is an antiplatelet. We talked all about the heparin warfarin to prevent the DVT, but to prevent the DVT, you have to understand the Verkauf triad, the very famous Verkauf triad, the stasis vessel wall injury and hypercoagulative state. So, a patient presenting with leg swelling associated with pleuritic chest pain likely to have a pulmonary embolism secondary to a deep venous thrombosis of his right leg. The Verkauf triad refers to the three circumstances required for a venous thromboembolism to occur. The hypercoagulability, the venous stasis, and the endothelial injury. 
It refers specifically to the pathophysiology of the DVT formation. The development of the DVT, remembering that the triad can help you to identify the risk factors of the DVT in surgical patient and understand how to reduce this risk. For example, the venous stasis, the stasis can occur during the prolonged operation or the hospital stay and the prolonged recumbency and pneumatic compression devices can reduce this. Please use the pneumatic compression devices to prevent the venous stasis while the hypercoagulability can occur due to dehydration or trauma or sepsis. The endothelial injury, how can this happen? This can occur due to inflammation, trauma or activated platelets due to hemorrhage, fluid resuscitation and chemothromboprophylaxis. So fluid resuscitation and chemothromboprophylaxis can be utilized to minimize this risk factor of the trauma or the platelets due to hemorrhage that's why resuscitation 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 is the first thing very first thing done in the atls fluid resuscitation and chemoprophylaxis is very important and can prevent you from the hypercoagulable status of course we all know that in resuscitation for atls protocol started with apc airway pressing and circulation we agree on it and the fluid resuscitation is very important in the sea. If we talked about the DVT and deep venous thrombosis, there is inevitable event that unfortunately can happen and it's nobody fault, like the fat impulse syndrome. A very famous scenario about a young man who is being managed in the ICU unit following multiple fractures sustained in a high speed road traffic accident. It's not it's noticed that he have experienced a drop in the oxygen, there is hypoxia. And there is seven days after admission, felt he is becoming more difficult to ventilate. And following investigation and diagnosis like CT pulmonary angio showed a fat embolus syndrome. Mm -hmm. This is inevitable event, it's nobody fault. And what can be associated feature that can help you to diagnose this patient is the TK. You will find the petechi, which is a red rash over the thorax, net and soft palate, and the conjunctiva, where the tiki can cause by micro infarctions. And by the way, after any elective operation, if you found the patient telling you about the rash over the thorax, neck and soft palate, he is not a whiny patient, he is not, she is not a sensitive whiny female, no, she is a lady complaining about a suspected fat embolus syndrome. And if she tells you she can't take her press, she is not a very fine lady. This is fat embolism and you can save her from the sequelae of the fat embolism because it's a serious event that can lead to death. Commonly to be found, especially after liposuction, unfortunately, yes, it's a suction that can cause dilatation of the blood vessels and cause fat embolism, or after multiple fracture, very common cause, and there is a very uh, famous episode in uh, Dr. House series, if you can remember, a patient who got trapped under steel with her leg below it, and after this fracture, she died with fat embolism and Dr. House didn't stand this situation. It's all about the fat embolism. Of course, there are many accompanying symptoms and signs that can come with the fat embolism like raising heart rate or bradycardia and there will be a hyperthermia. Take care, but the TK is very common a sign that can be elicited earlier with your eyes. Dear great surgeons, in a massive pulmonary embolism, the patient might have an acute circulatory failure with cyanosis, hypotension, and raised jugular venous pressure. The acute pulmonary embolism peaks in the incidence between the day 2 and day 10 after the operation. Although post-operative respiratory distress is common occurrence, it's more commonly caused by a basal atelectasis and pneumonia or aspiration. And 
and we agree that orthopedic operations such as femoral nailing can give rise to a fat embolism syndrome which can have similar presentation to the pulmonary embolism but take care the fat embolism more common to be associated with the skin petechiae or the tiki because the P is silent which are absent in the pulmonary embolism so don't confuse the pulmonary embolism with the fat embolism that's why we stress on the tiki due to the micro infarctions so pulmonary embolism remains an important differential diagnosis in the reliance on the non-specific investigation such as D-dimer or characteristic ECG changes that may lead to condition being overlooked and the D-dimer level is useless after operation because it will be high the D-dimer is a good negative but a bad positive especially in the surgical patient the D-dimer is a fibrin degradation product FDB which is formed in the body any time a clot is broken down by fibrinolytic system like the surgery surgery itself will cause the D-dimer to be high although a rise in the D-dimer value can be used to aid the diagnosis it's not specific to pulmonary embolism or fat embolism and can be raised in multiple other conditions including the trauma or the dissection pneumonia whatever inflammatory process can go it can cause a high D-dimer especially surgeries so a D-dimer is always raised after any operation due to the degree of bleeding coagulation trauma caused by the surgery itself so it's therefore not routinely checked by an immediately post-operative phase because it will be suspectedly high it will give nothing information to be added we all know that D-dimer after surgery will be high so it's not good for pulmonary embolism suspicion after surgery but in a clean version patient who didn't go any operation you can go for D-dimer now to a very famous critical symbol question what is the bleeding time the bleeding time is the time taken for a visible bleeding from a puncture wound to stop the time is measured between making a wound and the bleeding stoppage the bleeding time is usually between one minute to nine minutes maximum and it is a test for platelet function the bleeding time is prolonged in the presence of any platelet disorders take care simple question but very important let's have a trick question regarding dvt and apply our knowledge regarding the dvt on real cases you have a 78 year old woman who is awaiting right-sided growing dissection for metastatic spread of melanoma during the pre-operative investigation she is noted to have a deep venous thrombosis in her leg what should happen next to this case what you do with this case who is already have been prepared for the surgery hmm we are talking about metastatic spread of melanoma you can't wait more so let's continue surgery and admit to hospital and start here on intravenous heparin intravenous heparin has a short half-life and can be stopped before the surgery but delaying her surgery will almost cert certainly lead to a widespread metastatic spread of her cancer that's why don't delay this surgery it's already metastatic and take care warfarin is not used in the pre-operative phase since it has a long half-life and it can be difficult to be controlled the therapeutic level and delaying the surgery again will lead to a widespread metastatic spread for her cancer so there is no delay don't delay the patient and give her intravenous heparin as a short half-life and can be stopped easily before the surgery save this patient tricky question but common in real life but take care if the patient have a dvt and we have an elective surgery you can always delay the surgery until the patient become warfarinized for at least three months for fear of venous thromboembolism so take care if the patient is urgent or emergent go for it and give him the heparin which can be rever reversed while regarding a patient with an elective surgery like a hernia which is not uh, recently complicated 
go and tell the patient that he can be warfarinized for three months and we then can do the surgery for him hope this answered your query you just ask it in your mind and if you didn't think of this query because you are tired from this tough chapter that you have already slayed as a great surgeon hope this answered you so if emergent operation or urgent operation go for the patient and give him heparin and if it's not an urgent not emergent go for it and give the patient warfarin for three months and delay the surgery after three months you can do it for it hope this lecture was great for you until we meet again love you all